Well, well, well. So I'd say for some experimental, just sort of tapping around on a keyboard, um, not a bad track, huh? It's got a beat and I can dance to it. That's true. That is very true. A little Thursday track I whipped up in my spare time. Because it's today's, a, what was that? It, it feels very modern age. It does, doesn't it? You know, it's really difficult to um, get a, a audio sample pack that's medieval. <laughs> like, fantasy's sample pack is not a thing. So maybe I should make one for us. Yeah, I mean, I'm all in favor. Just get some hammer dulcimer sounds. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Howdy, Duke. A good Thursday unto thee, my friend. We're just warming up, getting getting ready for today's program. <laughs> this track is called Helloin. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Always good to see you, Duke. And hello to our other friends. You know, I'm certain everyone's already done this because you're obviously a longtime fan of Thursday Age and of Owen and, you know, maybe a short-term fan of mine. And, yeah. you know, maybe you want to uh, be sure that you're subscribed to our YouTube and our Facebook and our Twitter Anything else they should subscribe to? Do you have a periodical, Owen? I mean, I literally have a few, but they're they're not currently age-related. I see, I see, I see. Well, then we'll forget that. But today, I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Um, we're getting into some of the... We're getting into major, minor, and free actions, which I... Which I like. Combat actions for the age system. Duke says hi to you, Owen. Hi, Duke. How you doing? Well, now that we are sufficiently warmed, let me introduce Owen Casey Stevens. Yay! Hi, folks. How are you doing today, Owen? I'm all right. I'm yeah. I'm moving along. Yeah, me too. Me too. All right, and moving along. And here we are on Thursday. Talk to me about the inspiration for for what we're talking about, and let's dive in. Uh, so, <clears throat> one of the things that happens a lot uh, in role playing games is that a situation will come up, and players are trying to figure out how to deal with it, and they will look at their character sheet for options. Right? What what talents have I taken? What specializations have I taken? What equipment do I have? Um, if if I'm a spellcaster, uh, what uh, what spells do I have? What arcana, etc. Um, sometimes even what notes, and that's great. That's that's a perfectly uh, reasonable, intelligent, often useful option. But that means that when they're in that space, uh, it doesn't occur to them to check and say what is it that everybody can do. Right, because you don't have all the base rules written on your character sheet. You've got the stuff about your character. So, uh, if, for example, you are attacking someone and you're going, you know what? I think I just I need to do more. Da I'm hitting him a lot, but I just need to do more damage. Um, and I don't have any options to do more damage. And then it turns out there is a major action uh, called all out attack, which if you hit, you do plus one damage, but your defense goes down. Um, and, and I'll go into what major and minor and free actions are, but the, the whole inspiration for this was, uh, I periodically see people forget that there are universal actions that everyone can attempt, uh, that may well give you some tactical flexibility in a specific circumstance. Uh -huh. And so you can just add it to the list of things that you go through, right? There aren't that many actions. Um, I, if there are some that you like a lot, like if your character is 
frequently finding themselves uh, wanting to increase their defense. You could make a note where you have your talents and stuff, you know, defend, major action. Uh, just to remind yourself it's there. It is not unusual when I'm writing up NPCs uh, that are, you know, a monster, whatever they're going to fight. If there's something I want them to be looking at doing a lot, uh, I will write down an action. Um, the most common of which is if I've got archers, uh, I will write minor action dash aim exclamation point. Because otherwise, in the heat of the moment, I'll forget. But these are important parts of what make characters uh able to adapt to situations and some of the core rules of the game uh are i'm not going to say hidden but are specifically outlined in the action sheet so you know we're talking about in the basic rule book page 33 34 um and it's it's just about a page of material and i just i encourage everyone uh to go through it at least once uh per campaign right and if you're if you're a forgetful kind of person, remind yourself occasionally. Uh, you might just make a note on your character sheet, you know, actions, page 33, so that if you're in a situation, you're like, hey, how do we deal with this thing? And you're running down your character sheet, looking at what your options are, there will be that little reminder that there may be things you can do you're not thinking about. Well, so real quick, if folks are wanting to follow along um, at home, you're going to want to uh, check out page 33 of the Fantasy Age basic rulebook. And we'll go, yeah, kind of go right. on from there. So there you go. So um, yeah, go ahead. Let's start with the basics. Um, in Fantasy Age, there are three kinds of actions in combat. When I say in combat, I mean any time that we are keeping track of one action this round, one action that round, everyone gets a turn and you move on. Uh, that is frequently the case when you're having a fight. But you could also do it if something else timed and important was going on, right? If people are trying to run down a corridor before a giant Indiana Jones sphere crushes them. Uh, you could easily handle that in, in the same series of actions. And each round, you can take one major action and one minor action, or you can always replace a major action with a minor action. So it's one major and one minor, or two minor. Uh, and that's the big difference between major actions and minor actions, is that you can take two minor actions in a round, but you can only take one major. It's just that you can take a minor when you take the, the major as well. Okay. Uh, and you can do them in any order. And that is important because of what some of the minor actions do is possibly impact the next action you take. So you can take your minor action and set yourself up for your major action. And then there are free actions. And free actions uh, are pretty much just things that are expected not to take any extra time. Like uh, if you are in the middle of a fight and you want to yell at someone that that uh, the undead wolf pack is getting away... Uh, that's a free action. You can just shout that on your turn. Doesn't take any extra time. Presumably if you're stabbing or fighting or whatever, you can still do all that while you're making that free action. <clears throat> but uh, I really want to run down what the actions are, especially the ones that people tend not to think about and uh, give some examples of when they might come up because th these things can change how you handle certain situations. Uh, and I'll sort of start with the basics and then go more advanced, if that makes sense to you. Hey, real quick, um, yeah. before it brings up, my players are so programmed to not take penalties that they'll never use the combat option. I I mean, you know, that's, that's up to them. Um, there are actions on here that aren't penalty related, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the things you can do when you are a GM is uh, you can use these actions with your sorry i had something pop up in my computer my computer wants to do an update right now of course um, it does <laughs> of course it does uh you can as a gm always whip out some of these combat options and show people that they can be interesting and relevant and that can cause them to take a look at them more um it's the fear then you know it, you know it sounds like it's a it's a kind of a player mindset that they don't want to risk penalty yeah and that that can be a tactically perfectly valid decision, but there's stuff in here that isn't penalty related. So I um, see, I see. Let's yeah. let's go ahead and look through them. Um, so for major actions, uh, you've got your basics, your melee attack, your range attack, and your run. Um, the reason run is different from the minor action of move is that when you move as a minor action, you can go up to your speed in yards. Uh, 
If you run as a major action, you can move up to double your speed in yards. Since you can take a minor action and a major action, you could, if you wanted to, uh, go up to three times your speed, running as a major action, moving as a minor action. And that is how you cover additional distance. Huh. I have seen people utterly ignore the fact that run is an option and will complain, well, I can't, you know, I'm a melee fighter. I can't get to the fight um, because I just, I, I take my move action and then I guess I will just stand here and wait and see if someone comes nearby. So never forget that that just the base movement and going further uh, is on your list of options. There's all out attack, which you talked about, which does have a, a uh, as a major action, uh, that you take a penalty to defense. Now, some people don't like to do penalties. Um, Duke says many of their players use run to overtake enemies and surround them. Yeah, that's exactly the sort of tactical option that you can take uh, if you're keeping in mind what you can do with with these actions. Uh, so major attack is one of those ones that does have a defense. Um, you, you get plus one damage uh, and minus one defense. Now, if you're having a hard time hurting something, and it's not hitting you a lot anyway. That's the sort of circumstance where I, as a player, will frequently say, oh, okay, I'll take an all-out attack. If we all make all-out attacks uh, and we all hit in a round, and there are four of us, that's a four extra points of damage per round. And, and you can get through a fight more quickly. Um, obviously, if something is hitting you a lot, or if it seems to be right on the cusp, you might not want to take that minus one defense. But it really depends on where are you in the course of the combat. So real quick, in in this moment of decision making, I find that you know you've got a group kind of dynamic that's going yeah. on, and you've got stuff going on around the table, and you've got uh, it, it can be sometimes hard to see sort of the forest for the trees, right? I mean, you've got so many things moving around. What's a good way for players to sort of lock on to that that um, risk assessment and to sort of evaluate, you know, when it's a good time to really, you know, that, that, that penalty is going to be a, a safer bet and just as risky as anything else that yeah. you're intending to do. It, it frequently isn't a safer bet. Um, it can be <laughs> tactically advantageous, but that's going to depend on a lot of things like how well are you going to roll in your next roll? And in theory, we don't know those things. Um, that said, there are circumstances where you can look at those penalties and think to yourself, well, that's not going to be as big a deal. Uh, if you happen to have a mage that has the fate arcana and they are regularly uh, giving people, you know, a bonus to their roll equal to their stunt die, or uh, if you've got an ability that lets you re-roll an attack, or if you have a whole lot of armor, so even when you're hit, you don't take much damage. Uh, you can just look at, do I have any way to mitigate the penalty and uh, how bad does this penalty making whatever's happening happen really matter. I have been in a situation, for example, where uh, we're fighting something that is obviously very dangerous, and it's hitting my character every round. If it attacks me, it hits. It never misses. Well, if it never misses, I might as well take a penalty to my defense. I, it, if the, it doesn't make it any worse, it's still just getting hit, and I'm not less likely to hit if I'm making an all-out attack. So uh, rather than saying, oh, I'm not worried about this thing hitting me, you can go to the other extreme and say it's hitting us at will anyway, so let's get the extra damage if we're going to be hit. Some of that is just a matter of experience. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, if you are people that put things on a battle mat, so you've got a, a series of one-yard squares, it can be very easy to see, oh, okay, uh, if I run and then move, and that gives me triple my total distance, that will let me... Uh, loop around to someone. Uh, okay, we have we've got a specific question, which we'll get yeah. to here in a sec. Um, and uh, if they're not, if you have sort of people that do things with a description of where they are, sometimes players don't think about trying to get a tactical advantage because they're not seeing the miniatures on the board. But you can always ask uh, the game master, hey, can I cut them off? if I take this series of actions and do a triple move, and then, again, it's it's just theater of the mind, uh, and the GM determines, is that additional move that's going to let you do that? But but it's it's worth trying it. All right. Um, so, one of the major actions is heal, and uh, the rules for the major action uh, are in the, er, for healing are in the major action, right? So it specifically says 
uh, in order to heal, you must be adjacent to your ally and must have bandages ready. And the question is, uh, people often ignore the requirement text for bandages to be ready in hand when using the heal action. Is it written as intended or am I reading it wrong? Um, no, you are not reading it wrong. If you will look at the minor actions, uh, there is a minor action that's literally ready. Uh, you can ready an item that is stowed. As part of this action, you can put away something already in hand. You can thus put away your bow and draw a sword, for example. So in order to take the heal major action, you have to ready the bandages, and that's a minor action. And if you've got a, a you know, you, you're, you're running around with bows and arrows and someone's shot, you can put away your bow and arrows and get out bandages as a minor action. And then the heal is the major action. So it's it's not that you have to take two turns to pull this off, uh, although you might have to run over to somebody, which obviously slows down the order. But yeah, when we say in heal that you have to have these things ready, we are literally talking about the ready minor action. Uh, so that's a great question, and uh, this is also a place where uh, it, it specifically tells you if you do a heal check, uh, it's a target number 11 intelligence healing check, and if you're successful, the ally gets back an amount of health equal to the stunt die plus your intelligence, uh, and that's your intelligence score. Um, I've had people search through the book trying to figure out, hey, there's a heal focus. Where are the rules for how that works and how much healing I do? And it is right here with the action. So when you look at the heal action, uh, it tells you how that works. And maybe that's counterintuitive because uh, the rules for attacking aren't under melee attack, etc. But this is just a case where it had to go somewhere and you have to look here to figure out what kind of action it is anyway. So that's why it's with it. Uh, another thing that I think people don't consider enough is the major action to charge, which allows you to move up to half your speed uh, and make a melee attack against an adjacent enemy at the end of that, and you get a plus one to bonus on your attack roll, because you've charged them. So, even if you're a penalty-adverse group, uh, even if you are one of those characters that needs to take a lot of actions to get into combat, it is worth noting that, okay, if I am up to one and a half times my movement away in yards, I can, as a minor action, move up to my distance, and then, if I need to, turn even, and then, as a major action, charge, moving up to half my speed and making an attack. There's no penalty there. Uh, there's no reason not to charge if you have to move and make an attack. It's just that people don't do it because they don't look at and consider the rules. So that covers all our major actions. Out, all out attack, charge, defend. Oh, actually, it doesn't. I didn't even mention defend. Uh, defend is a major action that just gives you a plus two bonus to your defense. Okay. That's it. Uh, because you are parrying, guarding, you're defending yourself. It, it is, again, the sort of thing I have seen people, uh, if they've moved, they're not sure what's going on, and they're, they are they just don't think about the fact, hey, I've got a major action left. I don't know what's going to happen. I'll defend this round. So if it turns out that there are uh, jack-in-the-box assassins from the puppet empire. They're going to burst out of trap doors from the ground and try and stab us with eye knives while laughing. Um, since I didn't see that coming, I will have taken the defend action. I will be harder to hit when that surprise puppet empire attack springs, literally springs forth on us on either side. <laughs> um, so, that is the last of the major actions to cover. <laughs> so, all out attack, charge, defend, hail. And then melee attack and ranged attack are just to make a regular melee attack and ranged attack. You can do that. Um, the point of those being major actions uh, are that it lets you know what else you can do, right? So if I'm going to stab someone, uh, the rules for melee attack are in general elsewhere. But by telling you here it's a major action, you know, all right, if I'm going to stab someone, then I've used my major action and all I have left are minor actions. Uh, yeah, uh, it was noted uh, the nuance of the actions gets ignored a lot. I try and remind my players, but I forget sometimes too. Uh, I totally get that. Um, the uh, Fantasy Age GM screen can be useful for that. It's got the actions on it. Uh, but honestly, I frequently think about after a fight, oh, I should have had that entire line of pikemen charge. They would have been plus one to hit and three more of them would have done damage and it would have sounded impressive because I had a whole line of pikemen. Um when I make that kind of mistake, because I do, we all do, uh, what I try to do is remember it as a way to approach the situation later, which is why I frequently now, when I am looking at 
opponents to throw at people in an age game, I will look at the action list. And if there is one or two actions that seem particularly appropriate, I will write them on the sheet in in with their talents and specializations and their weapons and their attacks just so it's visually there and i'll remember okay so they've got this pike attack and it's plus five to hit and it does 2d6 plus six damage and then under that it'll say charge question mark and i will put that there so that i remember oh yeah charge is a thing in this game and i don't have to remember all the actions for all the npcs uh, but as a game master, when you're running a whole bunch of characters, I find it very useful to have like one written down per per opponent or group of opponents. Uh, when I'm a player, I really think the the smart thing to do is to write yourself a reminder to look at all of the actions because they can really change what's possible. And I have watched uh, in a play group, and this happened in the play test especially all the time, uh, a fight would be going and it'd be kind of difficult. And one player would be looking through the book and it's just something like okay so as a minor action i aim and that gives me plus one to attack uh with a melee attack so i'll aim and then get plus one on my melee attack and someone will go aim applies to melee attacks yeah no it says right here plus one to, to... so and then suddenly everyone goes to the book and is looking up the action <laughs> to see what is in it that, that they didn't think about um, and the fact that aim applies to melee attacks, by the way, uh, charge gives you a plus one to melee attack, but you have to move up to half your distance. The reason that that aim is a similar option is that we don't want people to be better off running back and forth, charging between two targets, right? Um, so you can charge, get the plus one, and then once you're there, you can just use your minor action to aim every round. And that gives you that that increased bonus to hit. And we're using 3 dice 6 It's on a bell curve. Um, if you are anywhere near the middle of that curve, that plus one can be a, a significant bonus. Um, Duke says, I do have the Game Master's kit sheet handed to my folks. Uh, then they... Oh, that's great. So then the, the stunts and the actions are always somewhere visible. Smart. Yeah. Most people, because stunt points cause you to get stunts and... Uh, at least in the basic rule book, we don't have a stunt attack or anything, although that's that's coming. Um, but in the, the Fantasy Age basic rule book, you're told when stunts become relevant. And so in my experience, if you roll four stunt points, most people will then go, oh, we're in a combat. I have four stunt points. Let me look at the stunt chart. There isn't the same sort of trigger to remind you to think about actions. If yeah. you've gotten into the headspace of going, I move, I melee attack. I move, I melee attack. I move, I melee attack. And you don't happen to run any stunt points. It may not occur to you that you, okay, uh, I'm going to charge this guy in melee attack. And then the next round, I'll aim and make a melee attack. And then the next round, uh, I'm going to put my guard up as a minor action. And again, we'll get to this. Okay. These uh, really can significantly change how the fight goes. Uh, so write a few down, give yourself some sort of reminder to look through them. All right, minor actions. Now, again, some of these are just utility things uh, that just tell you where they go. Like the minor action, activate. Uh, you can start using certain powers or items such as fighting styles and potions. Um, it, it's just, if you want a potion, okay, it's a minor action to use a potion. It says so right there. Uh, aim we discussed. Uh, you plan your next strike as a minor action. Your next attack is a melee attack or a ranged attack. You gain a plus one bonus to your attack roll. And that is the melee attack or ranged attack all in capital, meaning specifically the major actions. So you can't aim and then charge and get plus two because charge is not the melee attack action. And yes, that's a little fiddly and no, won't broke, break anything if you let people do it, but just be aware of it. Uh, Still in my interactions. Let's see, is Fanny Age Combat usually played on a grid or just as easy to play at gridless? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, Fantasy Age is definitely set up so that playing on a grid is an easy option, right? We give a, a one yard per square. Uh, we, we Everything is done in yards in Fantasy Age. And since most grids are uh, one inch maps, and these days most figures are more than an inch tall, right? A lot of them are are nearly two inches tall when you lay them down. That sort of heroic scale has become very popular. Um, that it can make a lot of sense to say, okay, here's my grid. I can stab anything within three feet of me. All right, that makes sense. If I need to go further than that, uh, I can charge and move one square and stab. So there is that mobility. 
Um, but a lot of people prefer it gridless, and it it doesn't have the kind of uh, you have to be on opposite sides of someone uh, so that a line drawn between your figures goes through the middle of the space taken up by the opponent in order to get special damage that is crucial to your character. That level of detail tends not to be uh, something that we crammed into Fantasy Age. So I've done a lot of, both as a player, as a GM, I've done a lot of what a lot of people call theater of the mind, where we're just thinking about where it are, where everything is. And when you do that, you just have the GM say, right, okay, they're 10 yards from you. And you can go, okay, 10 yards. My, my move uh, is seven. I can't get there in one move. So I'll move and then I'll charge. And that's 10 yards, which is the GM, what the GM said we needed. And that's what I was saying that, uh, even if you're doing it without a grid, it can be worth looking at some of these maneuver options, uh, not just the actions, but also when you get hero points, um, there's skirmish, which allows you to push someone along. And just uh, <laughs> being European, I use one square equals one meter, one, one, one yard. Yes, the difference between that is negligible. And by all means, okay. uh, you, you can do yards and instead of, uh, or meters instead of yards, and it will... It will, in the grand scheme of things, change nothing. Uh, it just means that you're using a much more rational distance system than uh, we Americans. Who... I think Brian's just bragging, honestly. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, there's a lot to be said for for the ease of conversion between yard and uh, meter. Although, you know, I've seen people take five foot squares and say that's two meters. And again, the change is not so great that that's, it's an issue. All right, uh, I want to keep going through these actions because we've already almost used up half our time. <gasps> really? I know, right? Uh, so guard up. Uh, it's a minor action. Uh, it allows you to decide to give either a plus one or a plus two bonus to your defense, uh, but you take a penalty to uh, all tests you make for the remainder of the current round. Um so, and guard up only lasts till the end of the round, uh, and defend lasts all the way until the beginning of your next turn. Uh, and then if you choose this, you must do it before any major action you take this turn, and you can't follow a guard up action with a defend action. So that is the biggest, longest, fiddliest thing I think we have uh, in, in the entire action section. Press the attack, which we'll get to in a minute, might be about as bad. Um, but it's reasonably straightforward, right? I take a I, I decide to either get plus one or plus two defense, and I will take minus one to minus two on all my tests after that. And if I really want that extra two points of defense, uh, especially if you're in the circumstance, for example, where someone says, hey, we, we got to drag Joey out of here, hold them for a moment, and you know you're going to take a, a battering, uh, you can say, okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take the minor guard up action. I'll take minus two to my attacks. I'll go ahead and attack one guy. But the main thing is I want to have a better chance of surviving here for one round. That comes up right there. Um, uh, Rain says, when you take the guard up action, since you take a penalty to test, does that make you more susceptible to effects uh, that you roll to resist? Yes, <laughs> it does. But uh, that only matters for things that don't require an attack roll, because if they have to hit you and then you resist them, uh, you are less likely to get hit. But it, it does, in fact, mean that if there is some sort of, you know, flea effect going that you have to make a morale check for uh that if you are worried about guarding yourself you are more likely to flee because you're more likely to fail that check and that is exactly the sort of thing that i mean this is a role-playing game it is uh educated by humans rather than by a a machine the gm can easily say yeah i know guard up says that you'll take a penalty to everything but i was using this check to try and avoid being hit uh by by spell fire and as a result, I'm not going to apply that penalty to you. And that's that's just a GM call. We, we don't want to get deep in the weeds of talking about every single possible exception because no matter what we do, players and GMs will come up with some circumstance we didn't think of. So right, right. Uh, it's a little quirky. Uh, Rain has absolutely pegged it. And uh, just as a GM, think about whether you think trying to defend yourself would make it more difficult to do whatever it is they're talking about. Um, if you're trying to defend yourself and as a result you are susceptible to fear, I'm actually okay with that as a, a GM and a player, right? Okay, I have taken this defensive action. Obviously, I'm concerned. That makes me vulnerable to magic preying on that concern. Uh, on the other hand, if I have taken a defensive action and I have to make a 
uh, agility test to avoid being shot by a firebolt. That probably shouldn't be harder, um, even if we, for some reason, wrote that so that it wasn't an attack roll with a firebolt. Uh, so there's move uh, as a minor action. You can move up to your speed in yards. Uh, you can also go prone, stand up, mount or dismount a horse or vehicle. But if you do so, you only move at half your speed. Uh, so what we're saying is if you're on a horse, you can, as a move action, dismount your horse and go half your speed. Okay. It's it's not, it's not complicated, but uh, if you don't look at the move action and you're on a horse and you're trying to figure out how long does it take me to get off the horse... There isn't a dismount separate action. So if you don't have some baseline familiarity, you can end up going, how much action does it get off my horse? And the GM might just go, eh, it's a minor action. And then you have lost that additional movement you could have had if one of you had recently read the rules. Not a big gotcha. deal. But, uh, prepare. You pick one major action that you prepare to execute and then end your turn. At any time before your next turn, you can interrupt another character and take your prepared action immediately. You don't use it by your next turn. The action is lost. You cannot take the prepared action if you've already taken a major action on your turn. What prepare is for is things like, uh, I hear rustling in the bushes. We're in the middle of a fight. I've got a bow and arrow. All right, I'm going to prepare to take the ranged attack action if anything comes out of those bushes. I'm sitting there. I've got my bow and arrow strung. I'm ready to go, but I'm not shooting until something pops up. I don't know what's happening yet. Okay. Um, or... Uh, in that situation earlier where someone was told, you know, try and hold them off for a while and you're in a doorway. Great. I prepare to stab the first person that comes up uh, so that I can hold the doorway. And it it's a short little thing, but it can be a very important part of uh, dealing with a flexible situation in, in a tactical encounter. And for theater of the mind, prepare can be a great boon to simplify things for the GM, right? Because if... If the GM is saying, hey, there are people with, with crossbows and they're popping up from behind cover and they're shooting at you and they're popping back down, we don't have it all drawn up. And you're like, well, do I have a line of attack? Do I not have a line of attack? It can make things very easy to say, I prepare to shoot a crossbowman when he pops up from cover. And then the theater of the mind is simplified because the GM can just go, well, obviously, if he can shoot you, you can shoot him. Uh, Duke asked, is a prepared action always superseding anything else happening? Um, so it specifically says uh, you can interrupt another character and take your prepared action immediately. So basically, if someone does something and that thing causes you to take your prepared action, then your prepared action goes off before the action that triggered it. Okay. Um you can occasionally have uh, a cascade of events where, you know, uh, I prepare to shoot someone if they shoot, they prepare to shoot someone if I shoot, and then one of my allies shoots, so they shoot, so I shoot, and then we're all preempting each other. And there is nothing wrong with the GM saying, look, just everyone make your attack rolls, we'll apply all the damage, all the arrows and spells are in the air at the same time. But as written, yes, if you prepare you will preempt whatever action causes you to say, okay, now I'm going to take that action. So a quick question, you know, I, what I notice from, uh, from our community, and I think it's, it's about being fair minded and, and cognizant of sort of, uh, you know, uh, finding reconciliation to the conflict that you're in, whether it's combat or a, a debate or you're influencing an NPC or something, but they're really, they really get into the rules and they want to make sure that they parse them correctly. And, you know, you'll, you'll sometimes you'll get an age, um, you know, someone who's just, they, they just know it inside and out, but they're the player mm -hmm. and the GM's like, well, we're going to do it a little differently. And so, you know, how, how do you, what's your thought on kind of reconciling those various sort of perspectives? Um, so first of all, uh, if you don't have a GM and you don't have players, you don't have a game. So the GM and the players hopefully will come to a social contract, be it uh, concise or not, that handles disagreements about how the game should go. Ultimately, the GM is the referee. And the way I always prefer to handle these things is the GM will state what they're doing. If that seems weird to a player, they will bring up why they think it's weird. The GM will then make a ruling based on the weirdness. And then that ends, you go on with the game, and if a longer conversation needs to occur, you just have it later when the game's over, um, possibly a day later. And, you know, we could 
get into rules like an instant replay with football, right? Where someone can, all right, I'm taking a timeout and I'm challenging that. And then the GM is going to take the time to read the rule book and everyone's going to write a quick Amortis brief. Yeah. Um, and you, you end up breaking the flow of the game for anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour. I would just prefer not to do that. And hopefully uh, everyone understands that we are all here at the table for us to all have fun and if two people are having a discussion about the rules, no one else is getting to do anything. And for a lot of people, having a debate in the middle of a game isn't fun. So after after a long time, you know, I, I game with some of the same people I gamed with for 30 years. Um, 35, 6, 7, 38. Years. All right, a while. Um, anyway, <laughs> we have simply come to uh, a place where we have discovered for us it is best for the GM says what's happening. If a player wants to know if the GM has forgotten something or gotten a rule wrong, they'll say, oh, are they doing that even though this rule exists? The GM then makes a ruling on that. And as the GM, it is not unusual for me to go, okay, so uh, they're going to move to here and then make a melee attack and move to there. And someone will say, oh, can they take a minor and then a major and then a minor? Is that a special ability of theirs? And I'm like, nope, I forgot. I already moved them. Okay, so they'll move to here in charge, right? It's not a big deal. GMs make mistakes. Right. Uh, well, but, maybe they purposefully decided that they are going to, you know, make this exactly. decision just out of expedience. So uh, you can have a situation where someone says, hey, three rounds ago, I just realized your guy took a minor action and then a major action and then another minor action. Is that a special ability? And you're like, oh, no. He shouldn't have done that, but I'm not rewinding this game by three rounds. Uh, tell you what, we will let the next player to go have an extra minor action. Okay, now the two sides are balanced, and okay. for expedience sake, it's done, and we move on. Um, if there is a a serious issue that that is confusing a player or threatens for a player to have less fun, or if a player just wants to know, hey, is this a house rule in this campaign I should be aware of, uh, like... If the GM ended up saying, okay, I have decided that uh, anytime you specifically take the minor action to guard up, uh, it actually gives you a bonus to oppose tests to avoid negative effects. If the GM has made that decision and not told anyone, and then that happens during the game, and then later the player's like, okay, wait, this isn't going by the rules. Is that going to be a permanent change? Uh, I've built my character on these certain tactics, etc. Right. You can have that longer conversation later. Gotcha. Um, so, that, that's great advice. Does that cover the question? Uh, yeah, it certainly does. You know, and I think oftentimes, you know, Owen, hearing from you, especially just uh, because of uh, who you are and uh, your consideration for these sorts of engagements, I just, it's very fascinating to me to sort of give some, a moment just to reflect on this stuff's going to happen and people are going to be sticklers for rules until the GM says that's not a problem, you know? So, there's a famous moment uh, in my gaming history that kind of totally changed how I view interacting with rules for a game, um, for a role-playing game especially. Uh, and this moment was uh, a friend of mine was having us uh, sneak into the military camp of a tactical genius. And so he drew out this military camp and the GM looked at us and he said, this is the military camp of a tactical genius. I, the GM, am not a tactical genius. Some of you know tactics better than I do. So there might be reasons that this is not how a tactical genius would set up their camp. But I'm telling you, they are a cap tactical genius. This is just the map we're using. And nothing your characters encounter on this map should convince you that this was put together by an idiot. Just assume that there's some tactical genius reason. Uh -huh. And that meant that we it. as players did not have to go, oh, I wonder if the tactical genius isn't here, or if it turns out he's a moron, or if he's been replaced by a doppelganger. We <laughs> all knew, hey, we're being told, we're being given the information, this is looks like it's been set up by, by tactical genius, this is just the map we're using. And that logic, I'm giving you players this information, and then we're just going to deal with what we've got, uh, kind of changed how much I worried about fiddly bits a lot in gaming. Um, right, another, right. Another famous example was uh, someone was playing a, a, you know, Viking war leader. And at one point the player was tired and had had a bad day and just wanted to play the game. And we came to the moment where we were going to launch this attack 
and he just said, hey, my character gives a bold and inspiring speech to the Warriors. Okay, bold and inspiring speech. You don't feel up to trying to create it. Roll a die. We'll see how inspiring it was. Great, and we'll just role play based on that. In a perfect world, everything would run perfectly all the time. We do not live in a perfect world. We, for the most part, do not game in a perfect world. And as long as everyone is trying to come to a series of social understandings that allows you to play the game, yeah. um, I, I think that it's it's fine to hand wave mistakes and move on. Uh, I think it is more fun to acknowledge and hand wave mistakes and move on than to try and drill down as to whether something is a mistake for longer than the mistake it took itself took to occur during <laughs> right. the course of the game. Right, right. I like that. That's great stuff. Um, all right. I do want to get through all of these because I don't want to do two shows on actions. So uh, we did prepare. Um, press the attack. This is an action that everyone who plays Fantasy Age should keep in mind. I'm literally going to read the whole thing and hopefully everyone will understand why it's important because they've literally seen people read, move, prepare, press the attack, their eyes glaze over because it's too long and they hop to ready. So here's press the attack. You stand ready to pursue an enemy if they should fall back or flee your blows. Declare an adjacent enemy combatant when you take this action. Until the beginning of your next turn, if that enemy moves away from you, you may immediately move up to your speed and yards in direct pursuit of that enemy at no additional cost in actions. This occurs immediately after your foe's movements before they can do anything else. However, you can only use this minor action on an enemy you have already successfully struck in melee combat this turn, whether you inflicted damage or not. When you make your move, it need not bring you adjacent to that enemy if you can't go that fast. In that case, you simply move as far as you can before stopping. You are free to forego some or all of the movement this action allows when your enemy triggers it if you wish. So, this is one of those things that happens with segmented movement. And uh, segmented movement can, in many cases, be the, the bane of a sense of reality in a game, right? If person A tries to run away from person B in a segmented movement game, this guy runs 30 feet and then does something, and then the next round, this guy can run up on him, when in fact, in reality, they would have been running along right next to each other the whole time. Uh, that can especially be a problem if the person runs 30 feet away and then drops a wall of stone between him and the person chasing him, which takes an action which he wouldn't have had the gap between them if the opponent had been running right along, which is what would happen in a movie or reality or choreography or whatever. So when there is someone that you want to make sure I'm staying on top of in a combat, then you make an attack roll, you hit them with a melee attack, you've proven that you've gotten inside their guard, they're not holding you at bay with their spear or their shield, whatever, because you successfully connected with their defense number, and then you say, okay, I'm pressing the attack as a minor action, so if they run off, I can immediately follow them, and if I've got enough speed, uh, I can follow them as far as they want to go, but also at the same time, if we're both running... Uh, and they get around a corner, and I come around a corner, and there are 50 stormtroopers there, I can stop my movement and stop following them because I have just seen that they're leading me into a trap. It's a little fiddly, I'm not going to lie, but it is one of the things that solves a common problem in combat when I go, you go, I go, you go, uh, in that it breaks up the flow of the action and, and activities so that it is possible when using these rules for you to follow along right behind someone so that they can't, you know, run down a set of stairs and across the room and close the door and then run off into the smoke screen and you don't have any idea where they are because they managed to get 180 feet away or whatever. Uh, so, GMs, uh, if your players aren't ever using this and they should, just have an NPC use it a time or two, mention it as an option. Uh, you can even... Uh, say, hey guys, I would like to do a mock battle so that we can all use uh, press the attack and get familiar with it, it can change the flow of some kinds of combat. It doesn't come up all the time, but it's relatively important. Uh, there's ready, which we already discussed. You, you ready something like pull out a potion. Uh, and again, since readying a potion uh, is different from activating a potion, you know that if I've got a potion in my stuff, 
I have to take a minor action to ready it and another minor action to drink it. So I can do that on my turn. But it means that if you think you might need to drink a potion soon, uh, there can be a benefit to readying it and running around with a sword in one hand and a potion in the other so that you don't need to ready the potion later when you actually need it. Uh, and then the last of the minor actions, stand firm. Uh, I'm not going to read this word for word, but basically with stand firm, uh, if someone tries to move you around or knock you down, it is harder for them to do. And stand firm is one of those things that people forget is an option because you only generally want to use it if you are running into people that are constantly shoving you aside or knocking you over, or if you're in a, a environment where that is particularly dangerous, right? If the GM is to say that this is a fight, uh, over boiling oil and you are all standing on single two-foot diameter wooden posts and so if someone successfully skirmishes you, you are knocked off into the oil. It is worth remembering that there are options to make it harder to do that even if they only come up sometimes. Oh, so, yeah, so for some reason I was thinking, what adventure, what kind of encounter would you start fighting over boiling oil? Like, that's my boiling oil, don't you touch it. But you're yeah, and that's that's the kung, kung fu training montage. I right? see. Is, is where yeah, I'm stealing right. that from. Um, <laughs> but same deal. If if it turns out the two you're having a, a fencing duel on the top of a cliff, and one of you has the back to the cliff, the other person might want to shove you over the cliff. So it is worth when you are particularly worried about where your character might get moved to. Even if that's as simple as I stand in the doorway and protect. Uh, our wounded members while they get out potions and, and heal them, so that's going to take time. So I don't want to be shoved out of the doorway so that the enemy can flow around. And, you know, in this case, I'm sure it's marionettes to the chainsaws, given the puppet empire example I gave earlier. Um, point is, you have an option to make it harder to get you from where you want to be. Uh, and then the final one. Oh, that is the final one. And then there are variable actions. Uh, for casting spells, each spell says how long it takes to cast, and reloading. Um, it is a major action, minor action, or free action, depending on the weapon used, your talents, and the stunts used. So we've got reload in there. Uh, the weapons tell you how much an action it takes to reload it, but then that is one of the things that obviously uh, there are abilities, like if you're taking, you know, archer specialization, you end up being able to reload faster, that kind of thing. Um but it is an action so that you can see what the standard is and remember that you might have talents changing it. And that's that's it for the actions, right? Um, it's not the, the end-all be-all of the game. There's a bunch of things you can do that aren't action-specific because they have a talent or a specialization or a magic item uh, that covers them. But if you don't have a decent grasp of the basics or at least uh, the instinct to go look at them, you will be missing opportunities that the game assumes you have, right? We don't give you a special ability to be able to keep up with someone because everyone can do that because we made a general minor action for it. Gotcha. And that's, you know, for, for these deep dive episodes, uh, we've deep dived into several different parts of the game. Actions can be invisible, right? Especially since there can be no prompt for a specific action. There might be no need for an action over several game sessions. It's especially if you're, you know, you're trying to play uh, once a month and you're lucky if you get in the game once every two months and half right. the time you're having to do it over a virtual tabletop. You can just forget some of the basics of how the game works and there aren't built-in reminders on your character sheet. There are like there are when you see, oh, hey, I've got this equipment. I wonder how I use it. Oh, hey, I, I have... Uh, I, I do this combat stunt for one fewer stunt points. That will inspire me to go look it up and make sure I'm familiar with it. The raw actions of the game don't have that kind of flag sign reminding you to go look them up. Right on. Well, so that's really good stuff. And um, I want to thank folks who have been sending in suggestions and ideas. If you've got a, something you'd like us to kind of take a deep dive into and sort of uh, let Owen uh, wax both uh, uh, prophetic and poetic. You can uh, send a note to let's play at greenronin.com and we will uh, endeavor to uh, get to those in a timely manner. Um, no guarantees. But uh, <laughs> I also um, wanted to say, you know, so we've got a ton of stuff going on, Owen. I mean, uh -huh. it's just been, um, we are doing an actual play tonight, and that is uh, with our good friend. Ian Lemke is going to be the GM. Um, it is 
Revelations of the Bakai, and it is a Cthulhu Awakens actual play. I'm telling you, this cast is amazing. I mean, just a, an incredible group of people who are super fun, um, myself included. Yes, I'm in this, um, uh, but uh, not are quite you as cool. Fun, Troy? Thank you very much. Um, but we've got. Um, uh, one of the uh, Shoshi Green, we've got um, uh, May Hemmer, and uh, and let's see, I don't want to forget everybody's names, but so these folks are. W- this is based in the '90s, so 1993, and we've all decided that we're going to get '90s up, if you will, and um, yeah, it's gonna be really <laughs> a ton of fun, and um, I think that you know, for me. Uh, being able to just sort of relax a little bit. I mean, I say relax, but you know, when you're doing an actual play, you're kind of, you're, you're, your head's in the game, right? Like you're, you're thinking stuff. And so that's, um, you know, that's kind of what, uh, what my, you know, what my goals are. You know, I, I thought, uh, as, you know, in sort of your experience for somebody who is, you know, kind of embracing doing sort of an actual play thing and, you know, in your mind, what do you think is uh, an important important considerations? And give give uh, give this noob a little advice. Uh, so there are, there are two specific things that I, well, all right, there are three specific things that I think about. Uh, first of all, always assume you're on a hot mic because I have been in the situation where uh, I nearly muttered something under my breath that I would have regretted having recorded and placed on YouTube and seen by thousands of people forever. Um, <laughs> Uh, context matters, right? And if you if you told a joke that gives one context just before the camera started rolling, and then you want to do a callback, uh, it's not a callback to everyone that's watching later. <laughs> right. So that's one thing. Uh, two, um, I tend to want to explain what I am doing quickly but efficiently in an actual play as opposed to assuming everyone knows. Um, so, for example, uh, again, with if I was taking specific actions, I might well uh in a game of my own just say okay i'm gonna go to here and here and i'll have charged and i'm plus to attack and then i roll and if all the players know what's going on that's great but if someone's watching and they're not as familiar with it it can be more useful to say all right i moved to here as a minor action then i'm going to charge him as a major action and that gives me a plus one to my roll and you're not going into a deep dive on the rules but the people watching have a better sense of why you are doing the things you're doing uh, and then third, uh, you know, you're being a tabletop gladiator. You're not just in a fight. You're in a fight that people are watching for fun. So I try to make my turn fun for the other players at a table anyway. That's what I want is my baseline. I want it to be entertaining for the other people sitting around the table to watch my character do whatever it is I'm going to do. Uh, I just crank that. I, I turn that knob to 11 during an actual play, uh, and I'm willing to actually make subpar or dangerous or might put me out of the game decisions if I think those decisions are going to be more entertaining for other people to watch and listen to. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. I like that. Now, um, I, and, and I'm actually, you know, um, I, I do pretty good. I think when, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of playing right on that edge of being silly and goofy and sort of having fun. And, uh, you know, as far as like gameplay stuff, like give me, you know, we're, we're, we're in the, um, the mythos, you know, we're, uh, we're up to our eyeballs in tentacles and we are, um, you know, exploring 1993 from our various characters' perspectives. What are some gameplay mechanics stuff that I should probably keep, you know, sort of ready at the ready? Uh, don't. Don't keep it. I mean, other than, oh, okay, looking at okay. no, other than looking at what your character can do, which is absolutely worth doing, right? Keep, keep, try to figure out what you're going to do on your turn before it's your turn. But beyond that, uh, let the game master guide it right he'll he'll okay. have things that he's doing and especially in an actual play you don't want to accidentally spend half your run time trying to upgrade your car rental uh when that's <laughs> not the, no matter how funny that might end up being if that's not the thing that the gm wants to have happen on this episode so that it is narratively fulfilling Okay, I like that. So don't put too much time into, you know, um, hamming it up, but, ha- you know, focus on kind of what will be entertaining and, and sort of uh, engaging at, with for the people around the table. I mean, and, I, uh, 
Yeah. I think it's very much a, a some improv rules apply, right? You try and yes yeah. and with everything, including the stuff the GM gives you, right? I like that. Oh, look, yeah. here's a yeah, as you're walking by, there is a dark, deadly glow coming from uh, around the doorway that you are walking past. Uh, you might well think would well, be perfectly rational for my character to go, mm, nope, I'm running off. And if you're gonna <laughs> run off and grab other people to help, that's great. But if if the GM is putting out stuff for you to interact with. Uh, then interacting with it is how you move the entertaining part of the the show forward. All right. Well, that is solid advice. Truly appreciated. Um, we will, like I said, we're going to be on tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to be in all these same places and you'll be able to pick up. Um, oh, here's a question before we go. Dwayne says, do all action modifiers stack? For example, does defend stack with guard up during the duration when they're both in effect? Good question. Yeah, so uh, defend is a major action, uh, which gives you a plus two bonus to the end of your defense. Guard up. Uh, da, 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 da. There's, it says something. You can't follow up a guard up action with a defend action. You right? cannot. You cannot. Uh, that's okay. part of guard up. So you can't guard up and then defend. Um, if things don't have rules like that, then otherwise, yeah, they stack. Okay, great. Awesome. So unless explicitly stated otherwise, they do. Yeah, in, unless that makes no sense, in which case the GM say, like, mm, yeah, no. All right, and the GM's the, the final word on that. And uh, and with that, I think that's the final word on this. I want to thank everybody for hanging out with us. Um, Thursday is always a good time. We really enjoy your questions and your ideas and your comments and um, look forward to it every week. Um, do check out the actual play tonight. That'll be in all of these places with that fabulous cast. I also um, had neglected to mention uh, Jonathan Gray is going to be there as one of the cast as well. Um, a uh, The whole group is just amazing. And so be sure to check us out. Uh, we'll be, you know, and I would say, you know, for the best experience, check out um, the YouTube channel. I find it's the least um, friction, you know, uh, you'll, you'll get to uh, right to the video and uh, not have to worry about, you know, uh, digging through all of the messages and things from your aunt and your grandma. Yep. Two hours from now, um, right here in this very place. And um, yeah, with that, Owen, thank you so much. Um, always fun to hang out with you on Thursday. Thanks, and. Sir. Uh, yeah, and be sure as well to stop by next Monday because we have a Mutants and Masterminds Monday program that we do. Crystal Frazier, Steve Henson, uh, Alex Thomas, uh, myself, and we have a blast. It's truly, it's truly fun. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your week and a joyous weekend, and we'll see you Monday or later tonight for that actual play. You get to see me. I might wear a wig. I don't know, but we'll see about that. Everybody, goodbye. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, folks.